<laughs> okay, Professor Billington is uh, is on injured reserve. So Shasta and Friant uh, in California will be covered, but we're just going to defer those uh, a bit, and we're going to take our uh, our tour to the east a little more quickly than we anticipated. Uh, so uh, today we're going to begin looking at um, at river basins uh, in the eastern United States and specifically in the uh, Ohio River Basin. We'll examine um, structuring of the Tigert Valley River Basin in some detail uh, and we'll look at uh, design and, um, and utility of the Tigert Dam in West Virginia uh, over several lectures, so it will be one of the one of the uh, themes around which we'll organize material both today uh, and uh, and next week. Um, there are a variety of topics that are going to that are going to um, uh, center on uh, development of water <coughs> projects uh, in the Tiger Valley River. Uh, some of them are going to be old topics that we began at the beginning of the semester. Uh, for example, we've looked at uh, we've looked at land management. In particular, we've looked at uh, things like forestry practice and how that uh, translates into structuring of river basins. Um, so that that's one of the themes that comes up in uh, in looking at uh, river basin management in the eastern United States and specifically in the uh, uh, in the Ohio River Basin. Um, uh, flooding and flood control are going to be of particular importance uh, in a number of settings uh, in the eastern United States, in the Ohio River Basin. Uh, and then today we're going, to, we're going to look in particular at West Virginia uh, and the role of flooding uh, in West Virginia. And it plays a very uh, special role in West Virginia. Uh, the, uh, so Tiger Dam, this is a, a view of Tiger Dam that has some of the standard elements uh, that we've looked at. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a massive uh, concrete gravity dam uh, with a spillway in the center of the dam. Outlet works uh, uh, on the bottom of the spillway. Um, one of the things that we're going to look at in, uh, in some detail today and next week is, um, is, uh, is the sizing of this spillway. And then it's going to tie back to some of the issues we've developed earlier concerning uh, risks and hazards associated with uh, with, uh, with extreme floods. And one of the things that uh, you're going to almost have to sort out for yourself uh, is whether this particular spillway here um, is awful large. Um, I'm going to make some arguments today uh, that suggest that it's a, it's a pretty big spillway for what, the, uh, uh, for what the Tiger Valley River has to contend with. So this issue of, uh, of designing um, dams, in particular designing spillways on dams, which are the main a way that we uh, that we deal with uh, with hazards like those we talked about with the uh, with the uh, South Fork Dam uh, in Johnstown. Uh, how how do we figure out how large we need to make these uh, these structures? Um, it's very important from the from the design perspective on the one hand because uh, we just can't allow things like the Johnstown Dam failure to happen, um, and on the other hand, it's important because if you look at the amount of concrete you've got to pour. It's really uh, driven by how, how large you have to make the thing uh, and sizing of the spillway, uh, the, 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 the capacity that you have to allow there is going to be one of the, the really big players in the amount of concrete you have to, uh, have to pour. So we've got this, these risk issues on one hand um, and then cost issues on the other hand. Uh, so those are, those are some of the themes that we're going to be looking at uh, revolving around the Tiger <coughs> Dam in West Virginia. Uh, just for the, uh, the political setting, uh, the Tiger Valley River uh, drains the, uh, the central mountains of West Virginia uh, and it, um, it joins with the Cheat River which also drains the eastern uh, mountains of West Virginia and the Allegheny Mountains. Their confluence uh, is, uh, forms the Monongahela River. Um, and then the Monongahela, the confluence of the Monongahela and the Allegheny coming down uh, from uh, north central Pennsylvania forms the Ohio River. Um, and uh, that junction is at Pittsburgh and, and looking at uh, 
flood protection in Pittsburgh is going to be one of the, the big themes for uh, flood control uh, in the Ohio River Basin. So the setting here is we're, we're going from the Tigert Valley uh, River uh, to the Monongahela, uh, the Monongahela and the Allegheny form the Ohio. And that's the sequence uh, uh, of rivers that we're going to be uh, looking at um, in our lectures on the Ohio. We'll, we'll flip to the uh, uh, Allegheny River in two weeks as well. So this is uh, the setting, mountainous West Virginia. Uh, West Virginia in many ways a very distinctive uh, state and just two ways of here of looking at the state of West Virginia. Uh, one is, uh, is on the left is just in terms of major river basins. Now just note we're looking at the Tigert Valley and the Cheat uh, River principally. They're the uh, the drainage basins that form the Monongahela, they're in the mountainous uh, east central portion of the Allegheny Mountains of West Virginia. And then on the right we've got um, a slide that shows the population density of West Virginia. No major uh, population centers even down in the center of Charleston. Uh, the Tiger Valley River Basin is going to uniformly have population densities lower than 100 uh, uh, people per square mile, so relatively low population density, no major uh, population centers uh, in West Virginia. Um, so that's, uh, that, that, that's uh, this uh, river basin and uh, population concentration are two ways of thinking about uh, the Appalachian region. Um, two other ways of thinking about it are in terms of the economy of West Virginia, coal is a very player and on the left it just shows um, areas uh, that um, are affected by um, abandoned coal mines in West Virginia and this is not even looking at active coal mines uh, but looking at areas where uh, management of abandoned coal mines is, uh, is, a, is a major uh, land management and environmental problem. And I'll just note in the, uh, in the uh, Tiger Valley um, River Basin uh, there are a number of areas with abandoned uh, coal mines. The, the other side of the uh, of, of land use for West Virginia is that by and large it's forested and that's that's essentially what the figure on the right shows. It's just showing the percentage of land not only that's forested but is that is in deciduous uh, forest cover and the percentages here range from uh, the dark greens are greater than 80 percent. The Tiger Valley River is um, almost uh, exclusively larger than 65% uh, deciduous forest cover. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got a region that's um, it's, uh, low population density, it has coal mining uh, and uh, many of the problems associated with coal mining, and other than that it's largely forested. Uh, agriculture practice principally um, in the valley bottoms uh, along rivers. There's very little land uh, especially in the eastern mountainous portion of West Virginia that's suitable for agriculture all other than this, uh, this valley bottom land uh, adjacent to, uh, to rivers. So those are, those are some of the, uh, the distinctive features of, uh, of West Virginia. Now, um, coal mining, just uh, an example of some of the things that are, that are, uh, that are present day issues. This just shows um, illustrates one form of coal mining. Uh, it's a form of strip mining in which you basically just chop the top, top off a mountain um, and then in the valley below you have what's called valley fill and this shows a valley fill terrace. Um, and you know you sort through the material that you've chopped off the top and extract the coal uh, and put the waste material then down in the, the valley bottom below and you try and make it stable. That's kind of an important part of it. Uh, but failures uh, of this valley fill have, um, have been um, important uh, uh, flood hazards uh, in West Virginia. In fact, in fact this past summer there was, uh, there was uh, serious flooding uh, in West Virginia. Uh, both coal mining uh, interests and uh, forest interests are being <coughs> sued uh, on the basis of uh, property damage and loss of life being related on the one hand uh, to this sort of failure of this sort of valley fill uh, material from coal mining, and on the other hand, uh, from renewed um, um, uh, clear cutting uh, in forest lands in West Virginia. So, land use uh, linked back to the flooding problem is not just an issue 
at the turn of the century, but it's also uh, an issue, in fact, that's under litigation uh, at present in West Virginia. Uh, this is a picture at the turn of the century. Now, deciduous cover much of the state currently uh, deciduous for us. Um, at the turn of the 20th century, that really wasn't the case. In particular, in this mountain corridor uh, in eastern uh, West Virginia, it was just covered by these enormous spruce forests. And this is just uh, to give you an example of the size of some of these enormous trees. So both of these images are taken from around the turn of the century. Uh, West Virginia was, uh, by 1910, um, and certainly the mountains of West Virginia, were completely deforested. Um, and the period of, uh, of, of intensive uh, uh, forest management in uh, West Virginia extended from around uh, 1875 only to about 1910. So over, uh, over a relatively short period of time, West Virginia went from an area that had a uh, large portion of its, uh, of its area in virgin forests uh, to effectively no uh, virgin forests uh, by 1910. Now. Um, See how well you can see this. Uh, a particular, can you see the lines here? Yeah, okay, so this is an aerial photograph that was taken uh, in the 1960s, and it shows the impacts of a form of, uh, of timber harvesting called cable, uh, cable log harvesting. And basic idea is you can see the river bottom here. Um, you've got a, uh, a little narrow gauge railroad uh, along the valley bottom that's constructed to a location here. You have cables extending up to the hill crest. Uh, you cut up the hill crest and you just slide the logs down uh, those, uh, those cables. Um, now, this area was completely deforested by 1910. Uh, so uh, in a 50-year period, there's been no subsequent uh, harvesting, uh, but the impacts of that harvesting are still apparent uh, more than 50 years later, and I'm sure that if you went back today, you'd still see uh, at least from aerial photographs, the same sort of thing. Uh, you can kind of uh, see in the edge of the practice, uh, the edge of this image, that the practice, you know, it just extends over to the next hollow, and you can kind of see it in this hollow too. So this was the, this was the method of, uh, of, uh, of forest harvest. You get a little narrow gauge uh, rail line in, uh, you just bring the trees down um, uh, with gravity uh, acting in your favor, um, and it resulted in, in massive disturbance uh, of the land surface, and, and disturbance of the land surface that, that doesn't just uh, go away uh, in a short period of time, but it's still manifested in the forms uh, that we see in the land surface uh, in the present. Uh, in the present, this is uh, in the Tigert Valley River Basin, just um, a clear-cut region, or a region that was clear-cut uh, two summers uh, prior, uh, in 1999. Clear cutting is practiced now. Its uh, best management practices are very different than the, uh, the cable logging at uh, the turn of the 20th century. It's still a practice in which uh, large areas, uh, large contiguous areas um, are cut um, and uh, it's a practice that can lead to, um, uh, to significant um, soil erosion. And it's a practice, again, that has, uh, with the flooding in the summer of 2001, has led to uh, litigation with um, uh, flood damages and flood deaths being attributed to the impacts of renewed uh, clear-cut forest practice. Um, so West Virginia has a number of, uh, of uh, problems that are, well, in some ways distinctive to West Virginia, but characteristic of the uh, of the mountainous uh, eastern United States. So looking now, instead of, uh, uh, as with the Rocky Mountains or in uh, the southwestern United States, we're looking at uh, high gradient mountainous regions uh, that, are, are, that are humid regions that have uh, relatively large annual precipitation totals. Um, so that's the context uh, in which uh, the Tigert uh, Dam was developed. Um, and the specifics of why uh, the Tigert uh, Dam was constructed uh, really relate to uh, the series of purposes that it addresses. Um, and these purposes, in order of importance, are listed here. Uh, flood control being first, flood control often just being of paramount importance 
when we're looking in the eastern U U.S., looking in the Ohio River uh, Basin. Navigation uh, coming in second, and then water quality and recreation distant third. Now, uh, uh, flood control is, uh, is, uh, is a good thing, um, but with that low population density, why would, uh, why would there be lots of pressure for, uh, for a dam on the Tigert Valley River? In fact, the Tigert Valley River and the areas downstream of it really aren't even uh, closely uh, located to any of the population centers of West Virginia. So flood control, uh, you know, why, why flood control in this particular area? Um, in navigation, there's no navigation on the Tiger Valley River. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a beautiful little river, uh, but you're not about to, uh, to go in there and, and get the little bit of corn that's grown, um, and, um, and um, timber is no longer uh, taken uh, by, the, uh, by the river roots. So flood control and navigation, we need to look at water quality is in fact tied to, uh, to local problems. Uh, water quality, at least at the time that the dam was constructed, uh, was, uh, was viewed as impaired by coal mining activities. And the basic idea behind water quality at the time the Tiger Valley Dam was constructed is that you could deal with those problems by dilution. You know, release some water uh, from the dam, increase the flow, dilute the uh, the, the high um, uh, concentration of, uh, of acid associated with, uh, of sulfuric acid associated with coal mine. Uh, so that was the main idea there. But what we're really going to focus on, and uh, the, the big deal in the Ohio is going, to be, uh, is going to be flood control, and it's not flood control for West Virginia, it's flood control for Pittsburgh, and that's the sole reason uh, for uh, construction of the Tiger Dam. Now, um, this is the, the Great Flood of 1936. Uh, it is the largest flood in all of the major uh, eastern drainages of the United States, uh, whether it's the Monongahela, whether it's the um, Allegheny, the Potomac, the Delaware, the Susquehanna. Uh, it's the largest flood in large drainages throughout the uh, eastern United States, a consequence of that flood. Uh, and earlier flo uh, flooding the preceding year in Texas was the flood control of 1936, which really provided the impetus for dam building for flood control in the eastern United States. Now, uh, that said, it had no impact really on, uh, on the Tiger Dam because, um, and, and I haven't told you about the timing of the Tiger Dam, it was almost completed uh, by 1936. Now, uh, in large part, that reflects the fact that uh, the flood of 1936 in Pittsburgh was a terrible flood, uh, but Pittsburgh's location just makes it uh, a prime target uh, for, uh, for uh, flood damages. And so flooding problems had been a major part of the Pittsburgh landscape uh, since settlement of the area. Uh, so the 1936 flood in Pittsburgh, it just emphasized the nature of the problem in Pittsburgh. It really didn't set the uh, the preconditions for, uh, for the Tigert uh, Valley uh, Dam. Now, uh, for th the big picture, if you look at the program that the Corps of Engineers put together for flood control for Pittsburgh, we're really, we're really just back to Arthur Morgan and the Miami Conservancy. It's the same basic idea, it's just a bigger scale. Uh, so in the Miami Conservancy, his idea is he went to the main tributaries uh, of the Miami River, and he built, um, he built dams on each of those main tributaries. Now, it just so happens the tributaries here are a lot bigger uh, than, uh, they, uh, than they were in the Miami River. The Ohio River uh, is much larger than the uh, Miami River, but the, the basic principle is the same. Uh, so what we'll see is a series of dams, one on the Tiger Valley River, uh, the Cheat, and the, uh, and the Allegheny, so the series uh, uh, flood control dams on the major tributaries becomes the way that we deal with, uh, with the flood problem for Pittsburgh. So again, a flood control program, much like the Miami Conservancy program, where flood control is really targeted at a large population center. That's the way you uh, justify the large expenditure of money uh, to construct a large dam, which in fact the, uh, the Tiger Dam was. 
Okay, so the program for flood control for Pittsburgh is going to be one in which we have uh, a remote dam uh, in the Tiger. We want to take a, a closer look at that dam in the Tiger. Uh, now this is, just, uh, this is just a different way of looking now at the, uh, the Tiger Valley River. Uh, the Tiger Valley River, the dam is located um, about here, and this is just the drainage network of the Tiger Valley River and the drainage basin. Seven, uh, several thousand square miles in drainage area, and it has this you know, really beautiful, elaborate uh, drainage pattern. One of the neat things about the drainage pattern is that it's, uh, it's really uh, closely tied to, the, to the, the geologic controls of terrain. So we get this pattern of drainages in between these major ridges of the Allegheny River uh, and then crossing, uh, crossing rid ridges. So the pattern of drainage um, is really one of the distinctive features of, um, uh, of the drainage basin of the Tiger Valley River. And we could, we could see the same thing uh, if we looked at any number of other drainage basins. Their pattern of drainage uh, you know, is really tied to, way, uh, to the way the land surface is put together. Here it's just tied to the fact that we've got, uh, we've got linear geologic controls of the, uh, the resistant rocks and so the high elevation portions of the basin. Um, well, that's, you know, that's kind of a neat thing. But I, I'm going to come back to arguing that it's that pattern of drainage that determines uh, the pattern um, of discharge uh, that the Tiger Valley Dam has to deal with for a big flood. Uh, or more specifically, it's going to determine um, both the magnitude uh, of the peak discharge and it's going to determine uh, the time distribution of discharge from a large flood. So what we're going to be working back to is, uh, is figuring out this idea, did they build a spillway way, way too large or not? Um, and part of the standard technology or a standard methodology uh, for looking at that that the Corps of Engineers has used for many years in design of dams um, is going to be a procedure called the unit hydrograph. And so we'll, uh, we'll introduce the unit hydrograph and show how that can uh, be used for, uh, for assessing the uh, uh, how big these, uh, these spillways have to be. Now this is just another look at the dam um, and I want you to, to strain your eyesight on a couple of features. So we've, you know, the thing we're going to look at is, is this spillway just way too big? That's kind of, kind of one question we'll think about. Now if you look at the, if you look at the dam and the reservoir, um, I want to make some observations here. They're, they're really some pretty simple observations. Uh, one is, you know, you sort of follow the crest of the dam and it extends out into this road here going along here and then it goes down to this forested area uh, down to the shoreline. Shoreline with uh, sort of a little sandy beach area. Now, just a, simple, uh, just a simple observation here. Here's the dam, here's the crest of the spillway, and there's the lake way down there. Okay, that, that's all. Now, no, uh, here's the level of the lake, and you know, here are trees up here, so the lake really doesn't get very high that often. Now, the, 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 the sole point here is that this is the way the Tigert uh, uh, Valley Lake looks most of the time. It doesn't, it doesn't come up to the crest of the spillway. We saw all these pictures of uh, Bonneville and Grand Coulee spilling. Uh, over the spillway. That's not the way the tiger works. Very different picture here looking at flood control. There's the lake way down there. Um, and so that's the, way, that's the way this thing's designed. We've got a lake and we store some water and we use it for other things, for navigation, uh, for water quality, for recreation. Uh, for recreation, in fact, we want to keep it kind of at a you know, reasonably constant level so that, you know, if you have things like boating, uh, fishing, uh, suitable for those types of activities. But the main thing that this lake does, uh, or that this reservoir does, is it doesn't hold water in it uh, unless you've got a big flood. So that's going to be one of the big sides. So we're going to have, we're going to have a nice spillway and we've got a big lake that we can put water in during times of flooding. Um, and you know, here's, a, here's one way of looking at it. This is just sort of some of the basic design elements uh, of the Tiger Dam. It's a pretty big dam. It's a pretty high dam. If you look from uh, stream bed to crest of the, 
uh, of the spillway, and, you know, it's about a 200 foot high dam. So we've got a pretty high dam. Um, now, I, I'm looking here, so we've got spillway crest, conservation pool, minimum pool, and stream bed. And we've got the elevations uh, of, uh, of each of those you know, storage elements. Uh, and then we've got storage capacity. So at the stream bed, you know, there's no, no storage. Uh, minimum pool, uh, 9,700 acre feet uh, of storage. And then what we can use, what we can routinely use, is 99,000 uh, acre feet. Okay. Now, this minimum pool, usually this is what would, you know, would rapidly fill with sediment, and, and so we're probably not going to have that too terribly long. But we've got about 90,000 acre feet of water that we can use for these things like um, uh, navigation in Ohio downstream, uh, or for water quality, or for recreational releases. Um, and then most of the water, though, is just, um, or most of the storage, is for storing floods. And we don't allow the lake to get uh, higher than this under normal circumstances. So it would only go higher than the conservation pool during times of flooding, or if there's special authorization uh, to have the, the pool go, uh, go up higher. Now, the Corps of Engineers often does that now if it's, you know, if it, if it's just really uh, extended um, uh, drought period and you, you, know, you want to uh, you have very little uh, uh, chance of flooding, uh, they allow the, uh, the flood control, uh, the conservation pool to float uh, and go above the uh, the, uh, the nominal conservation pool elevation. But the big picture here is that most of what uh, this, uh, this dam's going to do is it's going to provide uh, flood control protection. Now, um, so this is one way of, of looking at it. Um, now, gosh, I went, uh, 1167 was the elevation of the crest of the spillway. This thing's been, uh, been around since 1936, and in more than 60 years, we've never gotten uh, within 10 feet of the crest of the spillway. Okay, so that's one, art, one way of thinking about um, how big this, uh, this dam is. And you know, in the last 60 years, we're, uh, we're not even coming close to the spillway. Uh, so these, uh, these three flood events, Hurricane Agnes in 1972, Hurricane Juan in 1985 kind of brought us, uh, uh, brought us the highest level, and then a series of thunderstorms in May of 1996 did a pretty good job. Now, uh, the, the, the next thing I want to do is I, I, I want to just convince you that um, particularly these things, uh, these, are, these are pretty big floods. I mean, we're not, just, we're not, we're not fooling around in November of 1985 uh, or with this, uh, the flooding in May of 1996. These are these are going to turn out to be pretty big floods. Now, another way of looking at it is, um, and that we'll talk about um, next week, is the design criterion uh, for the spillway is the probable maximum flood. For Tiger, it has a, uh, a value of more than 300,000 cubic feet per second. The capacity of the spillway um, as of uh, prior to this year was rated at a little above that. Um, this 1985 storm uh, produced a flood that got up to you know, almost 80,000 cubic feet per second, and then the May 96, 70,000. Okay. So we're we're uh, we're pretty far from uh, from the uh, from the uh, design capacity of this spillway. Now, and the thing you got to remember too is that before you use the spillway, you've got to get up to it. So this isn't, you know, this is, uh, this is uh, once you've made your way up to the spillway capacity, then you can carry this much water. So flood control for this dam has got two components to it. One, it's got this big storage, you know, you store a lot. Uh, the idea being, you know, you've, uh, you've got a, a flood, large volume of water coming in, then the peak uh, reaches after you've filled and you have to pass the peak through the spillway. That's the basic. Uh, the, the basic design idea, but we've got a lot of, we've got an awful lot of storage capacity before we even get uh, to having to contend with the peak. Now, uh, the 1985 flood, I just want to show you some uh, images and give you an idea uh, that it was, a, it, was, it was a massive flood. Um, 
This is a, an image that's taken in the very upper uh, portion of the Tiger Valley River near a little town called Daly. Uh, we know how to get to Elkins. We turn left. Uh, we have our Evan route going. Uh, but this little town has about uh, 15 feet of water uh, through its downtown. That's really not the way they, uh, they intended it. It had never seen, in fact, water uh, in its, uh, in its uh, at that up to the town uh, prior to this event. Um, there were 33 deaths of people uh, from, uh, from the flooding in West Virginia. Uh, most of the bridges in the Tiger Valley River were destroyed. Yeah, I know, it's pretty gross, isn't it? Um, and uh, in addition to the 33 people, many, many uh, cows uh, lost their life. Um, and most of the bridges. Uh, this is one of the bridges that survived. Um, it gives you a sense, though, of how, uh, of how large the, uh, the flood was. The flood here goes over the top of the bridge. The bridge had structural damage, uh, but the bridge, uh, the bridge was, uh, was still there after the event. Uh, this um, in uh, an area in the eastern portion of the Tiger Valley River uh, in the mountainous area. Now, there, there are actually a series of three houses here. This is the remains of one. You see one back here and one here. Now, uh, you know, they look like they're in pretty bad shape, and they are, one completely destroyed. The, the catch is they began the day about a mile uh, upstream, and so a landslide and debris flow took these houses, uh, took them down the mountain, uh, deposited them at the uh, outlet of the, uh, of the little creek that they were located on. So in the, in the mountainous regions, um, anyone living in the hollows was in, uh, was in pretty bad shape, uh, from uh, not just flooding, but landslides and debris flows associated with the flooding. And the issue, uh, the land management issue there is whether it's, it's, um, it's the clear-cut areas and the valley fill from coal mining, that, are those the areas that initiate the, uh, the landslides and debris flows? <clears throat> just an idea, a sense of, um, of how high uh, flood peaks reach here too, and this is in the uh, this is in the valley bottom of the Tiger Valley River. It was a big flood. It was just a really, really big flood. Um, and ju just a look at uh, transport of a house in the Tiger Valley River uh, downstream. Okay. Okay, so that's the you know, the the uh, for this November 1985 flood, it was you know it was a big flood. Now we can look at uh, we can look at the discharge observations and uh, it's something. It has a return interval that's a lot longer than a hundred years. Um, how does it relate to the uh, to the uh, to the magnitude of events that we would like to protect ourselves against? That's the difference between this you know 78,000 and 340,000. Uh, cubic feet per second. Uh, th you know, this event uh, that we're looking at is um, it, it's much smaller than the Tiger Dam is designed to protect us against. Now, um, I want to just show, look, the May 1996 um, uh, flood, uh, close to the same uh, peak discharge into the, into the lake, um, and basically the same uh, pool elevation. Uh, so comparable to the 96 storm. I'm just going to give you, it was a very, very different storm. I'm just going to give you a sense uh, for some of the uh, uh, features of the storm. Um, and I'm going to do it uh, by, uh, instead of looking at just the impacts uh, of the storm and the flood, I'm going to look at some of the observations uh, that were made from the May 1996 flood. Um, one of the ways that we're going to, we're going to look at, um, at um, our flood response is going to be in terms of uh, the integrated property of discharge over time. Now the, the time series, uh, the time profile of discharge uh, at a given point along a stream channel is, uh, is termed the hydrograph. So much of what we're looking at is just the properties of, uh, of stream hydrographs. And there are a variety of ways that we'll look at that. We can look at the peak discharge we can look at the total volume of water, and you've done computations of, these, uh, of that sort. Uh, and we can look at various measures of how rapidly the drainage basin responds. 
Uh, one measure would be the difference um, in time between the peak discharge um, and the time centroid of rainfall. Now time centroid is just the time at which 50% of the rain occurred prior to that time and 50% afterward. So if we look at the time that characterizes uh, the central portion of the distribution of rainfall, you know, how does that relate to uh, the time of, uh, uh, of maximum flood response? And this is just um, a look at observations for the May 96 flood. And this is in the very upstream portion uh, of the Tigert Valley River. And it's at a drainage area instead of several thousand square uh, miles at a drainage area of several hundred square miles. And what's shown is just a series of rainfall averaged over the basin and then the hydrograph of the storm response. And I'll just make a, a few simple observations here. One is that we get this, you know, this series of pulses of rainfall uh, that occur. And in fact, the, the flood response is really tied to this you know, series of pulses of rainfall. And, you know, what's that all about? Um, the, the second thing is the time centroid of rainfall is something around uh, two. This is Greenwich Mean Time. And then the peak is about uh, uh, 12 Greenwich Mean Time. So about a 10 hour time difference. Uh, between when the rainfall is distributed over the basin, sort of a characteristic time of distribution of rainfall over the basin, and the response. Okay. Um, so that's one of the ways that we're going to, and one of the important ways of characterizing uh, a hydrograph is in terms of, uh, in terms of its response time. Now this is one view of that. Now this is, uh, this is a view of, um, of rainfall, and this is that 200 square mile drainage basin in the upper portion of the Tiger Valley River. This is another uh, 180 square uh, basin that drains into the Tiger Valley River um, called the Middle Fork River. And the contour, the black lines you, show, you see here are um, contour lines of rainfall. And I'll just tell you, you see the rainfall is oriented from northwest to southeast. And we have this just line of maximum rainfall it kind of cuts uh, through the Tiger Valley River Basin. Uh, and it's on the order, it's between uh, 50 millimeters or two inches uh, and between 200 millimeters or eight inches. So we just have this swath uh, of rainfall extending from northwest to southeast. Um, it's very different from the November 1985 storm. Uh, the November 1985 storm was a tropical storm and it was a period of two days. It just rained and rained and rained. Uh, not too terribly hard, but it rained, uh, uh, it rained over an extended period of time. The total amount of rainfall was significantly larger than it was in May of 1996. Here it just rained very, very hard uh, in short periods of time. Um, and in fact, kind of an interesting way of looking at it, um, is, um, this is a picture from, uh, from weather radar. And the yellow areas here are just the thunderstorms that go zooming through West Virginia. And in fact, what produced this, uh, this tremendous flood in May of 1996 was just a large number of these thunderstorms uh, that are zipping uh, from uh, Pennsylvania uh, from northwest to southeast through, uh, uh, through West Virginia and just tracking right along the Tiger Valley River the entire time. So that's the way it was done. Here's uh, several other times. So it's not, uh, it's not raining uh, over the entire state of West Virginia for two days. In fact, it's raining over a fairly small portion of the Tiger Valley River uh, at any time. But it was a sequence of storms that, in fact, produced uh, the large flood in May of 1996. And then here, the same sort of uh, characterization uh, of rainfall and discharge, and this time for the, that, uh, that uh, next door basin, the Middle Fork Basin. So again, the time, timing of response, if you look at peak and to center of massive rainfall, on the order of eight to 10 hours. So these are ways that we can characterize discharge. And then the tiger again. Um, but what we, what we would like to be able to do, and in fact, what we need to do for uh, design of spillways is we need to come up with some way of specifying um, if I get uh, two inches uh, of rain over the Tiger Valley Basin, 
Um, and none of it infiltrates. All of it makes its way to, uh, to surface runoff. Um, what is the time profile of discharge going to be uh, at the dam? Or if it's four inches, or if it's eight inches, or 10 inches, or 20 inches. So the design problem for spillways turns into a design problem where we really need to know two things. We need to know the peak discharge uh, that's going to be produced, and we need to know the total volume. And the tool that the US Army Corps of Engineers developed for, or one of the tools that the US Army Corps of Engineers developed for assessing that is um, this quantity, the unit hydrograph of a drainage basin. So we need to wrestle with the unit hydrograph and figure out exactly uh, what the unit hydrograph is. Now, the interesting thing in the definition is the unit hydrograph of a basin. And an important aspect of the unit hydrograph is that it is a property of a drainage basin. There, there are no storms around. It's just purely a property of the drainage basin. Okay, so the unit hydrograph of a drainage basin is going to be the time profile uh, of discharge from a unit quantity of runoff that's generated uniformly over the drainage basin, uniformly in time for a specified period of time. So if you get an inch of runoff over the basin in one hour, what's the time profile of discharge at the outlet of the drainage basin going to be? Now, here's the way you think about it. Um, the way you think about it is you stack an inch of marbles over the drainage basin and you let them roll out. And what you do is you count the number of marbles. It really is, it's just a property of the drainage basin. It's a property of a variety of aspects of the drainage basin, how rapidly they're going to roll. Now that's, you know, you, you've got Manning's equation to give you some guidance on how that might uh, play out. Um, how far they have to go, you know, if, if, you, if, you have a, if you have a hundred square mile drainage basin, there are an awful lot of ways you can do it. Uh, you can put it together. You can have a hundred square mile drainage basin that's one mile by a hundred miles long long skinny thing. And West Virginia is kind of famous for having those long skinny drainage basins. There you've got travel distances that range from well, zero at the outlet of the drainage basin to 100 miles at the furthest point from the outlet. Um, so it's, it's, uh, the unit hydrograph is really it's a, it's a property of the drainage basin and it characterizes how if you, you, know, if you, if you, put, uh, if you put water uniformly over the surface What's the time profile over which it's going to drain at the outlet? Okay, now um, we're going to introduce some um, uh, some machinery for uh, doing computations with the unit hydrograph. Um, we're always going to work with a fixed time interval. I'll denote delta t, and uh, for concreteness, think of it as um, one hour unit hydrograph. So delta T of one hour. Um, UI, where I ranges from one to N, is really going to be our unit hydrograph. And the important way of thinking about the unit hydrograph is it has units of cubic feet per second per inch. And it's really got a time um, argument to it in the subscript I. And the time argument I just says, if I'm looking at some point in time, um, then the unit hydrograph um, I, time, I times delta T time units before is going to tell me what runoff produced I delta T time units before will contribute now. So it's going to be telling us looking backwards how runoff produced over the basin is going to contribute uh, to discharge at the outlet of the drainage basin. And then the final idea is you know you have these, these, these hydrographs we looked at for uh, the Tiger Valley River, they went up and they went down. And the time period over which they go up and down is just going to be th this number of ordinates m times delta t. So m delta t is really just the time over which you go up and down uh, in, response to, uh, in response to a pulse uh, of runoff. Now here's the additional 
machinery for looking at unit hydrograph. And the thing we have to begin with is this, uh, we want to figure out what discharge is at some time in. Well, not really time in, time in times delta T. So delta T is one hour. Let's say we're going to get rainfall beginning the uh, first hour of the day. What's, uh, what's the discharge going to be at hour 20? Okay, so that's the kind of problem we're looking at. And what the unit hydrograph says is that if we want to know what the discharge is at some time in, and let's just call it a time for now, then all we need to know is how much runoff occurred during that time period and then how many CFS we get for that inch or that PN inches of runoff. Okay, so again here, U1 tells us during that first hour lag, how much of this runoff makes it uh, to the outlet. Then U2 tells us how much of runoff that occurred not in the previous hour, uh, but uh, in the hour period that began two hours ago. How much of that? makes it to the outlet at time in delta T. Okay, so we're working, just working our way backwards, looking at this chart at this time in terms of runoff at prior times and just keeping tabs on how they contribute to uh, discharge at the outlet. Okay, so the, the beauty here is that if we know what the unit hydrograph is, then uh, for the kind of situation we had with that May 1996 storm, there's rain, you know, it was, uh, it was, not, it was not uniform in time. Uh, we got the, all these different pulses of rain. And if we want to figure out what the resulting discharge is, well, uh, what the unit hydrograph says is we just figure out the quantities of runoff that are generated at those given times, add them up, and we get our discharge. Okay, now, uh, so for the timing, just to emphasize a couple of details. So here we're looking at discharge at a specific point in time. So QN is the discharge at time in delta T. PN is not the runoff at time in delta T, but it's runoff occurring in the time interval that ends in the delta T time period at N delta T. Okay. So we've got uh, we've got discharge at hour 20 expressed in terms of runoff over the hour from 19 to 20. We've got discharge at hour 20 expressed in terms of runoff that occurs hour 18 to 19. Okay. So that's the, that's the form of the unit hydrograph. Let's just give an example. So delta T one hour, the time base is five hours, so we go up and down in five hours. Okay, if we have an inch of rain uh, of runoff in an hour, then at the end of that hour we've got ten cubic feet per second. At the end of the second hour we've got a hundred, at the end of the third, five hundred, three hundred, one hundred, then presumably down to zero. At Six. Okay, so this is this is uh, this is beautiful. This just specifies now how our basin is going to respond. We've got things like you know here's our representation of the uh, you know the time lag that's sort of built in. We've got representation uh, of uh, a peak, the distribution of volume with time. Those are the basic features that the uh, Army Corps of Engineers wanted to incorporate. Now let me just go. Here's here's an example. So hour one during the day, you get two hours of runoff. The two hours? Two inches of runoff. Now, remember, two inches of runoff is, is two inches over the entire basin area. It's a volume of water. So two inches of runoff. What's uh, over the next five hours, hour one, hour two, hour three, hour four, hour five? What's the, what's the discharge? 10 times 2, unit hydrograph times 2, unit hydrograph times 2, and so forth. 20, 200, 100, 600, 200. 
Okay, so one of the one of the features is that you know if, instead of having one inch, we have two inches. We know how to do things. Now let me just uh, sort of I have that or not. Let me show you one more. There's just two basic things that we do. One is instead of having one inch, we have some multiple of one inch. The other thing is instead of just having it in one time period, it's in several time periods. Those are the only two games that you play with the unit hydrograph. You look at the response to uh, the precipitation and then runoff forcing um, and you relate it to a unit response. So if instead of having one inch uh, in an hour, you've got, in this case, one inch in one hour, two inches in a second hour, well, discharge it in the, into the first hour is, well, it's your one inch times the uh, unit hydrograph uh, ordinate for the present hour. At the second, well, now Q2, P2 is two, so two times 10. 100 is the unit hydrograph ordinate for lag two, and so you just march, uh, you just march on doing computations. And so you can elaborate that as much as you like. Um, and uh, so the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers expended tremendous amount of effort in deriving unit hydrographs for basins. So for the Tigert Valley spillway, um, they have a unit hydrograph. Uh, and the unit hydrograph is a big part of how large that, uh, that spillway was designed. Now, the other part they have that we won't, uh, we won't deal with today, but next week, is figuring what these things should be. And that was, uh, that was based on uh, an idea of Arthur Morgan's uh, that he, in fact, used in the Miami um, Conservancy. And that's the notion that um, you just took, take the maximum amount of precipitation you can possibly have. And so that we'll introduce the notion of probable maximum precipitation. And we put probable maximum precipitation together with unit hydrograph, and we'll get the form of discharge. So that's the, uh, that's the uh, those are the two central elements that go into play in looking at how big, um, uh, how big we need to size spillways, and, and a variety of other uh, design issues associated uh, with river basins, figuring out how much how much rain can occur, and then what's the response of the dra uh, drainage basin going to be. I just want to end with one final observation, and that is in the Tiger Valley Basin, uh, this unit hydrograph, uh, you can think of it as just some, uh, you can think of it as some uh, um, notion not tied to rivers, or you can think of it as, as really just reflecting the distances uh, and velocities that water has to travel over the drainage basin. So it's really the plumbing uh, that dictates the unit hydrograph. And I think that's a, that's a good way to give you some physical intuition for what this idea is. Okay, have a happy Thanksgiving. We hope to get back to California next week, and if not, we'll, uh, we'll enjoy more time in the Ohio.